The Lord has given us a wonderful gift in His Word. In His Word, we find wisdom and guidance and strength and encouragement. And today we're studying Jeremiah 29, one of the most famous passages in the Bible in terms of words of encouragement and hope. I'm Russ Brewer, pastor of Wellington Community Church in Wellington, Colorado. And this is our daily podcast as we're going through the 366 key chapters of the Bible, one per day, so we can ultimately have a firm grasp on the entire Word of God. So again, today we're turning to Jeremiah 29, and we'll discuss God's words of hope to the repentant believers in the exile. Now, as we go to Jeremiah 29, let's pause and think about what we've been reading about in the book of Jeremiah so far. A lot of what we've been reading about has been God's warnings to his people about their violations of the covenant. Just basically, after more than 400 years of living in the land, they have managed to create a society that was wicked and deceitful and unjust and full of hypocrisy without true regard for the Lord and his commandments and his holiness. And just they did whatever they wanted. And they were even following after false gods. And therefore, God has been warning them that since they broke this covenant, if they would not repent, they would be removed from the land, not to decimate them, but to discipline them, to demonstrate his sovereign rule over their very existence. You see, this judgment was going to show them that any success, any vitality they had in the land was not because of their false gods, Baal or Ashtoreth or whoever they might want to follow. It was because of the Lord. And if they don't get themselves right with him, they wouldn't have any prosperity at all. And so that was the basic gist of Jeremiah's message. And he kept on warning them, even though they refused to listen to him, and at times they even sought to kill him. But we know from our studies way back in 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles, that Babylon eventually comes down and begins a series of deportations on the people. And the first wave of this exile or this deportation occurred in 605 BC, when a small group of people were deported. And now that brings us to Jeremiah 29, because Jeremiah 29 is the record of a letter that God had Jeremiah write to the Jews who were in this exile, in this time of deportation. In fact, if you look at verse 1 in Jeremiah 29, it says, Now, these are the words of the letter which Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the rest of the elders of the exile, the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. And so Jeremiah is in Jerusalem and he is writing this letter to the Jews who are in exile and he is writing on behalf of the Lord. Now, one of the chapters that we've had to skip so far is Jeremiah 24. And Jeremiah 24 is a passage that actually says that if the people were going to be faithful to the Lord, at this point, they just need to submit to the captivity he was bringing upon them and they should go off into Babylon and let God do his cleansing work in the land. And in Jeremiah 24, it actually describes these believers who go into the exile as good figs in the midst of a rotten batch. And so the good figs will be taken out of the land while God's judgment is poured upon the bad figs that remain in the land. And so by virtue of being the exile, by and large, Jeremiah's audience is comprised of repentant believers, those who are seeing these prophecies coming true and those who are yielding to the word of God. And so God has Jeremiah write a letter that starts out in verse 4 saying, Thus says the Lord God of hosts, uh, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. And so just letting him know this is the Lord writing and he knows about their exile and he knows what's going on. In fact, he is the one who has caused these events to happen. And so what's the message that God has for these people? Well, starting in verse 5. Verse 5 says, Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. And so right off the bat, the Lord is letting them know that they are going to be there for a while. He's going to tell them in verse 10, it's going to be 70 years. So they're going to be there for a while. They might as well build houses, plant gardens, and harvest things like they always have. Then in verse 6, it goes on to say, Take wives and become fathers of sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do not decrease. So he's basically saying, Live as you normally would. In fact, conduct marriages. You're talking about a multi-generational event here, and you still need to be increasing as my people. And then he says something that is very surprising in verse 7. He says, Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will have welfare. Now, this is a stunning bit of instruction here because the Lord is telling his people that even though they are not in control of the land, even though their politics, so to speak, are going against them, nonetheless, they are to pray to the Lord for their captors, basically, and to seek their captors' welfare. And he's saying specifically because if Babylon prospers, so will the Jewish people living within it. And this is just a reminder to all of us as God's people that we should be praying for our government and the government leaders, regardless of of if they're even supporting what we would value, we need to be praying for them. That's why Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, 2, that we should be praying for the kings and all who are in authority. 
You see, even though we're, we're supposed to be caught out of this world, we are to be praying for them and ultimately that they would come to Christ and they would be submitting to God's plan for them and for the countries in which we live. Well, going on in, in chapter 29, uh, the Lord then gives them a familiar warning in verse 8. In verse 8, he tells them not to listen to the false prophets in their midst. He says in verse 8, For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Do not let your prophets who are in your midst and your diviners deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams which they dream. For, verse 9, For they prophesy falsely to you in my name, and I have not sent them, declares the Lord. And so there we see that not every person who's gone to the exile is a true believer in the Lord. And we even have some false prophets here, but we're going to see in a moment, God has a plan for them too. And so these false prophets were deceiving the people before the exile, and here they're still deceiving them in the midst of the exile. And so God is saying, do not listen to them. Now, we talked a lot about these false prophets a couple of days ago when we were in Jeremiah 23. And so these prophets just want to give the popular message, one of peace, one of success, you're going to do okay. But the Lord is reiterating here in verse 10 that 70 years is going to pass before they're released. And so if you look at verse 10, it says, For thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place where Jeremiah is writing from, Jerusalem. And so even as we read verse 10, we can see God's words of hope for these people because after the seven years is complete, the Lord promises to bring them back to the land of their fathers. Well, now that brings us to verse 11. The Lord says in verse 11, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and hope. Now, this is a well-known verse in our world. It's on many calendars and postcards and things like that. It's a beautiful verse. But we need to understand this verse in its context. These words were written to people who were banished to a foreign land because of their sin and rebellion. And now that they've been exiled and, and now that they're so much under the control of Babylon, they've got to be wondering if God has any more plans for them. And here the Lord is encouraging them that he still has mercy and grace for them and he still has not forsaken them nor abandoned them. And what they're going through is ultimately all a part of his refining plan. And so God's discipline for them will achieve its attended purpose. And look what's going to happen on the other side of this discipline. When you get to the verse 12, it says, the people will call upon him and pray to him and he will listen to them. And so they'll be calling upon him, not false prophets, not false gods, but upon him. And he will listen to them and be in fellowship with them. He says in verse 13, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Now they're going to be truly devoted to the Lord and they will find him. And that's just a great principle for all of us. If we want to find God, we should seek him with all of our heart. And it just shows us here that the Lord is so ready to embrace the repentant believer. And when he hears of our repentance and we turn to him, he is right there to reestablish our relationship with him. Now notice this section has one more verse that's not normally included on the calendars when they cite this passage. Verse 14 says, I'll be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and will gather you from the nations from all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from where I sent you into exile. And so when they seek the Lord and when those 70 years are fulfilled, God will bring them back to his land and they will have peace and prosperity, that very peace and prosperity they wanted all along, they will have that in the Lord. And so those verses there are the most famous section of this chapter. But this chapter continues on. Remember, this is a letter that is being written. And so the letter goes on in verse 15. And the Lord tells them that those who remain in the land would continue to be facing his judgment. In verse 16, this judgment would be for the king and for all the people who stayed. And in verse 17, the Lord will send upon them pestilence and famine and violence. Why? Well, he tells us in verse 19. Because they have not listened to my words, declares the Lord, which I sent to them again and again by my servants, the prophets, but you did not listen, declares the Lord. Again, this is just that idea that those who are actually being faithful to the Lord would submit to the exile and they would go into the exile. The rebels would actually be the ones who stay there. The bad figs would stay there. And we're just seeing that here in this chapter. The godly people submitted to God's judgment and went off into exile. And it was the ungodly ones who acted in disbelief, who tried to hold down the fort in Jerusalem. And part of the problem was because there were still false prophets there declaring that the exile would be short and that the people would prevail. And so the Lord finishes out this letter in verses 21 to 32, that he's going to destroy these false prophets, specifically one named Zedekiah, who is no relationship to the king, uh, and the Ahab and Shemaiah as well, because they were seeking to usurp the Lord's message. If you look down in verse 25, they have sent letters too, completely opposite of Jeremiah's message. 
Again, Jeremiah had been telling them all along, it's going to be a 70-year exile, and that's what God commanded. But these prophets were apparently saying, no, it's going to be short and easy, sweet. You'll be back from Babylon in no time. And so the Lord tells them in verse 32 that he's going to be bringing his judgment upon these prophets because the last part of verse 32 says that they have preached rebellion against the Lord. And it's fascinating here. This message of peace, peace, everything's going to go okay, can at times be actually just rebellion against the Lord because to preach something that is not of him is ultimately disobedience to him. And so that's chapter 29. Again, this is a key chapter because it's so well known with these encouraging words and also because it reminds us again of the timeline of the Babylonian captivity. So with this passage here, although it's so familiar to us, how should we apply this to our life? Well, for one thing, we need to be careful that we don't overapply this passage to any and every situation we might get into. One of the dangers of interpreting the Bible is that we might take Scripture out of context and make it say something to us that it was never intended to say. This passage here was written to Jews in exile. Now, there are some principles that transfer to our day, but we need to be very careful in where we get them from and how we use them. And so when we come to this passage, the first thing we need to do is remember and understand who is the original audience. Again, the original audience were these repentant Jews who were in exile. Second, we need to understand what God's message was to these people. And God wanted them to know he still had a plan for them and would restore them after the 70 years of exile was completed. And then when we understand what that message is, we can then start to see if there's any principles that appropriately transfer to our world. I mean, we're probably not in exile right now. And even if we were, we don't have the guarantee that it's going to be a 70-year exile before we go back home. And so we need to be looking for the eternal principles, kind of climbing almost like a ladder of application. And we just need to go a little bit higher in that ladder and look around and say, are there any higher principles we can see here? And I think we do have some. Uh, For one thing, we're seeing that God has a good plan for repentant believers. And we can reasonably surmise from the rest of Scripture that he has a good plan for us too if we are walking in fellowship with him. And so if our orientation in life is submission to God and total obedience to him no matter what might come, We can know that God has plans for us and not for calamity, not for judgment, but plans of a future and a hope. And we can trust that and take that to the bank because it's always true. The Lord gave a similar instruction to the church of Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, when he said, For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so God has good plans for his people. But on the other hand, everything God does is good, right? Everything is righteous. And so even if he is disciplining a person, even if someone's rebelling against him, that person can know that God's plan for their own life is still good. Now, it might be a plan of judgment, but it is still righteous in its judgment. It's still good and holy in its judgment. And although that person may not enjoy it, it is still a good plan. And so that's one takeaway from this passage. Uh, another, another one or another application is just to see how quick God is to restore a believer who repents. We see this principle in stories like the prodigal son, where the father just receives that son back once he repents. And we may struggle, we may stumble, we may fall, but we have the assurances from Scripture that whenever we turn to the Lord, he is quick to hear our prayer and to acknowledge our repentance and bring us into his good favor once again. Sometimes you might think, well, maybe some sin is just beyond the scope of God's forgiveness. That's not the case. Anyone can repent and find grace and mercy in the Lord. But along those lines, Uh, A third takeaway is that when we do not listen to God, often his hand of judgment is going to get heavier and heavier in our life. Uh, Just even thinking about this passage where we're at here in Jeremiah 29, there's only been one, maybe two uh, waves of deportation so far. And we know from 2 Kings 24 that after the second wave, King Zedekiah continues to rebel against the Lord. And in 2 Kings 25, again, the Babylonians come on down for the third time But this time they capture Zedekiah and his family and they kill his sons right in front of him and then blind him. And so Zedekiah refused to listen to the Lord and the Lord's hand of judgment just got heavier and heavier on his life just to get his attention. And unfortunately, Zedekiah never turned to the Lord, never repented. And so this is just a warning to ourselves that we should always be seeking to heed God's word, to always be repenting before him, to never hold on to our sin, just to repent before it's too late and let God lead us and guide us in the plans he has for us so that we can see verses 11 to 13 where we know that when we call upon him and we pray to him and when we seek him, we will be established by him for the work he has called us to do. So those are some ways to apply Jeremiah 29 to our life. It's a great chapter and an encouraging chapter. Hope you're blessed by it. I know I've been. And with that, we'll call that a wrap for Jeremiah 29. Thanks for listening to this chapter. Hope you have a great rest of your day and I look forward to catching up with you tomorrow. And until then, God bless.